before I preach or share the ideas of the homily today, you got to know who I am, okay? Um, I've been serving here in Manhattan at St. John's on uh, 66th Street for the last seven years. I was ordained a priest for the Diocese of Patterson, New Jersey, 50 years ago. And in these last seven years, as because I was retired, I moved to Manhattan and started helping out at St. John's. Beautiful church, beautiful parish. It's a Slovak parish. And now they have enough priests. So I looked around, as I mentioned before, and I contacted Father Michael. We had a meeting, and it was like love at first sight. He said, come. He gave me, you know, you, you know he's trusting me because he gave me the keys to the house. So you know I'm in, I'm in. And besides the keys to the house, I know where the espresso maker is over there. So I'm really in. He invited me here to assist. And once I realized St. Anthony's in Little Italy, this is like a gem. This is like one of the dreams of an Italian-American priest come true. I was raised in another Italian-American church in New Jersey, in Jersey City, Holy Rosary. And some of the statues here remind me of Holy Rosary. And some of the architecture is definitely very kind of Romanesque Italian architecture, very much like Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. One of the patrons of my family has been St. Anthony of Padua for years. My godmother's last name was Anthony. She was ma married to Vincent Anthony. So Anthony became her patron. She was crippled for many years, and I was with her as a child every day, and after school and high school and so on. I'd visit her all the time, and she was my godmother. So Anthony has always played an important role in my life. About a month ago, I went to the, the, gar the garage where my car is parked at St. John's, and next to my car was a statue about this high, about four feet, St. Anthony, just sitting there in the parking lot. Okay, I'm Italian, so I, I appreciate statues. So he went into the car. I don't know why it was there, but it was the same exact statue that my family has had since 1938. It was my godmother's, her name is Lena. It went to my, my grandmother after, that, after she passed. Then it came to my mother, went to my brother, and now it is in the home of my, my nephew, Michael. Same size. Now I have that statue. It's a statue. But you got to be aware of God's presence in your life and the messages he sends. I did not know then that I would be here at St. Michael, St. Anthony's Church. It was two months ago. When I came here, I realized I had received the sign. I was being let go in a sense of that church. I was no longer needed. And I'm being picked up by St. Anthony's Church. I'm grateful to Michael. I'm grateful to Chuck and the people I've met so far for their hospitality. And today before Mass, I sat over there just to pray before Mass, and the first image I see is the Immaculate Conception of Mary on my left. I was ordained on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Mary, the Immaculate Conception, has been a patron of mine, again, with St. Anthony, or my priesthood. I think I'm at the right place to serve the right people at the right time. So I thank God who watches over all of us and I watch over my patrons and thank St. Anthony and 
Immaculata, the Immaculate Conception, for my being here. Now, you may not thank them. Once you hear me, you, you're exposed to me, you may say, Maron, take them away. But for now, I'm here. Let's get to the Gospel. Let's get to the Holy Scriptures today. I'll make everything fit. You'll be out of here in a good amount of time because it is a little humid, but we're not going to worry about that. We're here to spend time with God. We're here to spend time with Jesus. We're here to learn more about Jesus. And the theme today that Jesus touches on is calling his apostles, let, let, let's go away for a while. Let's, get, let's go for a rest. What happened was they were preaching, they were healing, they were doing miraculous things, and they were exhausted. And they didn't have not even time for bread. Manganapets of the pan. They, they couldn't eat because they were so busy. So Jesus says, come away. Whenever we read the scriptures, we never read them on the surface. We, we read them with depth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four evangelists. This is Mark's gospel. Mark has an idea in mind that he's going to reveal. I'm going to keep it secret for now, but next week in the gospel continuation, you'll find out what he had in mind by saying at this point they were hungry. We'll get to that. So Jesus calls them away to a deserted place. What's that? It's vacation. He called them away for the weekend, maybe to go down the shore, maybe to put their feet up, maybe to relax, maybe to go into the desert without anybody bothering them just like Father Michael is today. He's on vacation, and he deserves it. So Jesus had in mind that his, his shepherds, his people, had to also get a rest, come away. But Jesus, he's unbelievable sometimes. He sees right through everyone, right through the heart. They go away take the boat across Lake Genesaret. They land on the other side. The people knew where they were going. They kuda, 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 ran around, went there, and met them. When Jesus got off the boat, there's a phrase that Mark uses, translated from the Aramaic and then the Greek, and we have it in English. Jesus took pity on the crowds who were hungry, tired, and probably hot. But the, the original word he uses from the Aramaic is it tore his guts up when he saw these people. And we, some of whom have Italian origins, we have translated that as agita. He had agita when he saw the people hungry and tired. He was hungry and tired. His apostles were hungry and tired. That wasn't his worry. The people were his worry. And you'll hear next week what he does to take care of that. Or if you want to know ahead, go to, go to the gospel and read the next chapter. The whole scriptures today are talking about God's love for his people. Let's go back to Jeremiah. Now, you guys today had a little bit of an introduction about me personally. So you're going to give me a little leeway because you're going to be here a little longer than the average homily. But much answer. The first reading was Jeremiah. And it wasn't a good reading. The reader was good. The words were good. But it wasn't a beautiful reading. It opens up with, woe to my shepherds. And we Italians know if someone says something like that, it's like, wait until your father gets home kind of thing. Woe to my shepherds. Gee, God, speaking through Jeremiah, was not happy with his shepherds. And who were his shepherds? The priests, the leaders of the temple. Not the prophets. The prophets were always the critics of the shepherds. They wanted the shepherds to do what was right. So Jeremiah says, woe to them. Because, why? Because they've scattered my people. 
They've not given them good example. They've not fed the hungry. They've not taken care of the poor. They have not governed with justice. They governed just to get ahead. Who wants to be the first place? Who wants to have the place of honor? And Jeremiah is saying, God's going to get you all because you're scattering the people. And Jeremiah says, God's going to call them back like a remnant scattered all over. He's going to call them back and bring them home under the leadership of a new Messiah, a new king. As a matter of fact, he'll be a member of the house of David. Remember King David, the first king of Israel? He's going to be a member of that house. Well, all the kings were members of that house. But this king is going to have a new name. And he says, the name of this guy is going to be the Lord our justice. What does that mean? Well, it's a play on the name of Hezekiah in Hebrew. His name is Hezekiah, but it doesn't mean Lord our justice. He gives him a new name that is in Hebrew comes out to be the translation, the Lord our justice. So this king is going to be replaced. He's going to be pushed off the throne. That's the goal of the gospel today, the readings today, that God goes out to us and wants us to come back, not alone, but with others, to come home. Jesus did that. When Jesus saw the crowds, his heart was moved to pity. He had agita he, because he couldn't stand the fact that they were wandering without a leader, without food, without guidance. He calls them back. We'll get into that as the gospel continues next week, as I mentioned. But the interim, we have Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which gives power and strength to that action of God going out, calling people back. Why? Because he sent the new king of Israel, the new Messiah, the new shoot from the family tree of David, Jesus. God the Father sends his son Jesus to go out and bring back, to go out and feed, to go out and teach and touch. And we have that Jesus. This is not Jesus in the Old Testament. This is us now, today, with Jesus. When we come up to re receive the Eucharist, we are receiving God's gift, his Son, into our lives, into our bodies. So that message continues. How does Paul put it in his letter to the Ephesians? We need God's peace. And we were scattered before Jesus came on the scene. But with his blood, we are united. He came and preached peace to all who were far off. See that idea of people from all different lands coming together, all different areas or the city coming together? Jesus came to bring all of us together in peace. Very beautiful message that we all appreciate. Sometimes we can't appreciate it because we might compare our leaders, church or secular, political leaders, and say they're not doing that. They're not bringing people together in peace. They're not showing their best step forward. We know right now the Eucharistic Congress that's going on in the Midwest is attempting that to share the message of the Eucharist, that it is Jesus calling us together, no matter where we are, New York, Minneapolis, California, calling us together to be a community of believers so he can feed us, like Mark did. The other night, many of you may have watched the convention, the political convention, doesn't matter who represented, but toward the end of it, when they were talking about their candidate, something struck me. We know his history, we know what he did and all this stuff. 
But what they included in the message of who that person was and is, is members of his family. People who've known him for 30 and 40 years. And the common word that kept coming up so odd for political convention was love. Now that particular candidate loves his country. How that particular candidate loves his grandchildren and his friends. Not unusual. Very good for us to reflect on. That is what Jesus is showing today. How he loves you and me. Yes, he loved the 5,000 way back when. And he fed them. But he continues to feed us. Because from all over the world, he calls us together to feed us and to show us his love. He's God's shepherd for us. And he calls us to love as he loved, to feed one another love and respect as he did, Jesus. These stories of the Gospels are not from way back when. These are our stories. When Jesus looks at you and me, and we're upset, depressed, angry, enraged, he has ajita. His heart is breaking with pity. He doesn't turn around and walk away. He comes to us and asks us to come closer to him in prayer, in the Eucharist, and in love for one another.